Welcome to the third in my series of short podcasts about the stories of the Tudors. My name is Tony Riches and I'm a historical fiction author from Pembrokeshire in Wales and I'm a specialist in the history of the early Tudors. In the previous podcasts I looked at the life of Owen Tudor but there would have never been a Tudor dynasty without his son Jasper who is the subject of book two of my Tudor trilogy. Owen had three sons Edmund Tudor was the father of King Henry VII and he was captured by the Yorkists and died in mysterious circumstances in Carmarthen Castle on 3rd of November 1456. And Owen Tudor is also thought to have had another son who he also named Owen who became a monk at Westminster Abbey. But it was Jasper who saved the young Henry Tudor and helped him become King of England. So as part of the research for my Tudor trilogy. I followed the amazing journey of Jasper Tudor and his young nephew Henry all the way from Tenby in Wales, close to where I live, to their 14-year exile in Brittany and ultimately their return to victory at the pivotal Battle of Bosworth. Now there are many stories but the historical record raises questions and I wanted to see for myself what primary evidence I could discover. So Wales had become a dangerous place for the Tudors by 1471. The Lancastrian cause was lost and Jasper Tudor found himself trapped in his castle in Pembroke with his young nephew Henry and their position must have seemed hopeless. Then at the 11th hour the siege was broken by a band of Welsh rebels led by David Ap Thomas. It would only be a matter of time, of course, before York's men found out and returned in force. So Jasper and Henry took what might be their only chance to escape to France. Tenby, the nearest town uh, was where they could hope to find a ship, was already taken by the Yorkists. And the story that's handed down over the centuries is that they hid in a cellar belonging to a wine merchant named Thomas White. And then they escaped to the harbour at night through a secret tunnel. It was easy enough to find the location of Thomas White's house in Tenby as there's a small bronze plaque on the wall outside what is now Boots the Chemist's in Tenby High Street. Under a Tudor rose the plaque reads, by tradition Henry Tudor with his uncle Jasper Tudor, Earl of Pembroke, was hidden in the cellar on this site before escaping to Brittany in 1471. In 1485 he landed at Dale and defeated Richard III at Bosworth to take the throne as the first Tudor monarch. The manager of the shop agreed me to show to show me the tunnels and we started in the basement cellars which are now used as storerooms. As we entered the tunnels deep under the street we were plunged into darkness and had to rely on torches. I saw the roof of the tunnel closest to the entrance had been rebuilt with bricks and the remains of an ancient fireplace complete with a chimney and I thought that this is evidence for its use in the past perhaps to hide people who might need a fire for warmth. Further down the tunnel the roof was just hewn through the bedrock and it looked to have been done centuries ago but unfortunately the tunnel had several exits Uh, one of which led under the nearby church and another to the harbour and they were bricked up but although it wasn't possible to follow the trail to the harbour I could see how the stories of how the Tudors escaped from Tenby could be true. Well I've sailed from Tenby Harbour many times including in complete darkness at three o'clock in the morning to catch the tide just as the Tudors would have done And there are dangerous rocks just below the surface as you head out into the Bristol Channel, bound for the equally hazardous Land's End, which they would have had to navigate before they could even begin heading towards France and the uncertain welcome they might receive there. It's said that Jasper and Henry's ship was forced to take shelter from a storm at the island of Jersey uh, before the long sea voyage saw them land at the small fishing port of Le Conque in September 1471 and of course that's in Brittany not in France and they were promptly arrested by the Duke of Brittany's men and escorted to the capital of Nantes 
um, and then on to Duke Francis's Chateau de Hermine at Vannes, where they asked for his protection. And Duke Francis was fairly sympathetic towards them, and uh, he would have immediately understood the political value of them to King Edward IV. The Duke was soon visited by Yorkist envoys who tried to negotiate their return, and encouraged by King Louis, Duke Francis promised to ensure the Tudor's safety as his guests while they remained within his dominion. And that's quite an important term because it meant they were effectively his prisoners at Chateau Hermin in Vannes. Little of the 14th century palace can be seen now because the hotel was built on the site in 1785, but I did manage to get a sense of what it might have been like because there were lots of medieval buildings still in the vicinity. And the Tudors spent a whole year in Vannes as the Duke's guests, during which time they would have learned a great deal about the politics of Brittany, France and Burgundy, which would have helped Henry prepare for his future role as king. King Edward IV offered a big reward for the capture of Henry Tudor, despite King Francis having given his assurances and in October 1472, the Duke became concerned that the Tudors might be abducted by York's agents and moved them from his city to what he called his hunting lodge at Sicinio. Uh, it's actually a castle by the sea south of Van. And I visited the castle at Sicinio, and amazingly, it's been restored to look much as it would have done when the Tudors stayed there. It's close to a wide sandy bay rather similar to the one they would have known at Tenby, so I imagine they would have felt relatively at home there. And after a while, the Duke realised that they could just as easily get abducted from Sicinio, uh, so he split them up. And I stayed in the medieval town of Jocelyn, which is where Jasper Tudor was held in the chateau and planned his return to England. You can The chateau has also been altered a bit over the centuries, but you can identify the tower where Jasper might have been held and look out and see his view of the river and the small bridge. And there are the remains of a row of cottages from the time that he would have been able to watch from his window. Then Edward IV died unexpectedly and helped by the King of France on Monday the 1st of August 1485, the Tudors sailed from the mouth of the Seine with a mercenary army of some 4,000 men to challenge King Richard III for the crown. They made landfall at Mill Bay, a secluded beach in the far west of Wales, just before sunset on Sunday the 7th of August. The ships were unloaded and Henry's army made the short trek to the nearest town of Dale, where they camped for the night and made preparations for the long march through Wales to confront the army of King Richard. I visited Mill Bay, it's not far from where I live, and I was pleased to see a bronze plaque commemorating Henry's landing there. The bay's far enough from Dale for them to have landed completely undetected, but I did notice that the path up the hill is quite steep, and the Tudors had brought artillery from France, so it must have been quite a haul despite the number of men. The final stop on this journey in the footsteps of the Tudors was to the famous Bosworth battlefield where there's an anniversary battle reenactment event each August. It's run really by the Richard III Society so you'd be forgiven for not understanding that the Tudors won the battle uh, despite being significantly outnumbered and Henry suddenly found himself being made King of England uh, a role that he wasn't really that prepared for, or particularly wanted, quite honestly. And his life as king is the subject of the next podcast. I'd now like to share with you a sample of the audio book edition of Jasper, book two of the Tudor trilogy, which is narrated by James Young. He held his breath and shivered as he strained to listen. Sound travelled well in the frosty woodland the rustle of a blackbird foraging for worms in fallen leaves, and the sudden wooden creak of an old branch bending in the cold air. He heard the noise again, the heavy scrape of hooves on the stony track coming his way, hunting him. 
too tired to run, he would not be taken prisoner by the men of Edward of York. Jasper remembered his father's warning. Their proud Welsh army marched over a hundred miles from Pembroke, stopping only at night and starting again each day at dawn, when his outrider returned with grave news. They had sighted York's army camped near Mortimer's Cross on the old Roman road near the crossing of the River Lug, directly in their path. We should avoid them, head north under cover of darkness, his father suggested. His voice kept low so the men wouldn't overhear. He had looked his age from their long, cold march across Wales. Too old to fight, his father insisted on riding with them. I owe my life to King Henry, he argued, and I owe it to your mother to support him now. Jasper recalled his terse reply. It's too late! He saw the pleading in his father's eyes and softened his tone. They know we're here, father. I will try to negotiate terms if we're given the chance, but we must be ready to fight. In truth, he doubted York would be in any mood for talking since his own father, Richard, Duke of York, was beheaded by overzealous Lancastrians the previous December. Then came the news that Sir Richard Neville, Earl of Warwick, and York's right-hand man, had captured King Henry, Jasper's half-brother. He had thought York's soldiers were no match for the men of Wales and the battled-hardened mercenaries who rode with them, but he could not have been more wrong. Their enemy outnumbered them more than two to one, and proved to be experienced and well-prepared fighting men. The salvo of arrows descended without warning in a black cloud of death. One struck deep into the neck of Jasper's horse, which reared with a demented whinny of pain, throwing him from his saddle. He barely managed to scramble to his feet and draw his sword before York's men-at-arms charged, hacking with axes, maces and swords, slashing and killing without mercy. Hold firm, men! Stand your ground! Jasper yelled out as he fought. For a moment he sensed their attackers wavering as men at the front fell dead and wounded. Then the mounted mercenaries behind him turned and galloped away. One after the other, Welshmen threw down their weapons and ran for the safety of the trees, pursued by merciless York soldiers. Their enemy took no prisoners and cut the fleeing men down, flinging their bodies into the slow-flowing, red-running river lug. A knight in gleaming armour, a head taller than those around him, fought with such ferocity he cut a swathe through the Welsh line. Jasper recognised Edward, Earl of March. The new Duke of York could have stayed on his horse and watched the battle from a safe distance. Instead, he had been determined to avenge the death of his father and chose his ground well, driving the Welshman back towards the river. Jasper experienced the brutal savage terror of hand-to-hand -hand fighting when he stormed the castle at Denby the year before. Then he had been the attacker with surprise on his side. Now his own men died around him in the ferocious onslaught by York's trained killers. He drew on every ounce of strength and years of practice as he battled for his life. Tiring, he parried a scything swipe from a sword and sank to his knees, struck over the head with a murderous blow from a poleaxe. His helmet saved him, but blood flowed into his eyes. Dazed, he staggered to his feet and thrust his sword into the body of one of his attackers. The treasured weapon wrenched from his grip as the man fell writhing in agony. Jasper cursed with shame at the memory of what he did next. Heads turned at the sound of thundering hooves as York's cavalry, hidden until now, charged around the left flank to surround the Welsh army. He had seen his chance to escape and taken it. He ran like a scared rabbit, sprinting until his lungs strained as if they would burst, abandoning his men and his father to their fate. Jasper, book two of the Tudor Trilogy, is available from Amazon and links to all my books can be found on my website at tonyriches.com. My next podcast in this series will be about Henry Tudor's time as King of England. Thank you for listening.